this and how we make the routing rules along with this in order to not achieve what you just showed the routing rules and like how traffic gets routed so to, to oh. this is how the mesh is actually so what we have here is like you know as you, uh, as you showed earlier so there's an envoy in every port and traffic enters the ingress controller which is also running envoy and then traffic like ex exits also through envoy which is a dedicated egress controller and the idea behind that is that you would actually be able to apply policies at the controller to control oh Oh, it says reconnecting. Network connectivity issue. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, yes. This thing is still trying to connect to the network. So it's still trying to connect to the network. Yes, it says it says network connectivity issues. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So as I was saying, the uh, the egress envoy, the role for egress envoy is that like all traffic that exits a Kubernetes cluster and tries to access external services, for example, that you might want to like consume from outside the Kubernetes cluster, they would also be subject to rate limits, policy enforcement, and so on. So that's the idea behind using an egress envoy to direct all traffic to that. And then traffic in the cluster gets fully encrypted and it's like, you know, with help of ECT authentication, Istio auth module, which basically installs a certificate per service, and then we set up mutual tailors authentication between every pair of services. Certificates automatically rotated periodically. And so all of this happens behind the scenes. So what you see is HTTP2 or HTTP1 communication between services with or without, it's mostly with TLS if you turn on Istio auth. And the traffic between services always goes through. Now, how does this work in practice? What we do is that like all traffic, I mean, we have an init container that basically goes and installs a bunch of rules, that, I mean, IP table rules that literally traps all traffic that enters and leaves a pod and routes them through a specific port, which is basically where that's where Envoy is actually listening. And once traffic gets to Envoy, Envoy basically decides where the traffic should actually go to and then processes it as either a TCP request or a, or a HTTP request and so forth. And in between, and by, uh, in the course of this process, like what happens is when Anwar has to forward a request, it talks, or when Anwar receives a request, it actually goes to the mixer, it checks if this request is actually allowed to enter the service or not, and if it's not, drop the request. If it is allowed, then it actually allows the request to pass through. That's the, the overall flow. And in this context, Pirate basically interacts with the platform, in this case, Kubernetes, like we are also working on adding other support like console, Eureka, and so on. It kind of gleans information about what are the services, what are the pods that belong to the service, what are the various labels that are attached to the services, and all of this information is gleaned. And with that, we actually like configure Envoy accordingly in order to route traffic. The way that actually happens is the, the way we've structured Pilot is like, you know, we have a plugin model. So there's an abstract service model that we have in Pilot, which is like, you know, essentially saying that here are the services and here are the pods that belong to the service and each service and each pod has one or more set of like labels that are attached to it and then we map this information to I mean we extract information from the underlying platform so in this case for Kubernetes we extract the information we map it one-on-one -on -one to our internal service model and once we have all the information that we need then we generate the routing rules and and the our configuration for Envoy accordingly and then we serve the configuration to a dynamic API, which we will talk about next. So the idea behind this is that we do not want to do any sort of pod reloads. For those who have actually done any like reloads, will actually know the pains of it. So we decided to not do any sort of hot reloads. So Envoy has like almost 
95 percentage of configuration envoy can be dynamically reloaded without having to restart anything and so there's actually no like loss of connectivity or there is no interruption at all and once we set we've set up all the envoys such that they talk to pilot they fetch their configuration periodically and they get reloaded this is how we actually like update envoys over the days so somebody is asking like how long is the propagation delay for our tools it basically depends on when an envoy currently polls pilot to get the new route tools but with the newer version of envoy what we're trying to do is we're just changing the entire thing to grpc based communication such that whenever we have a new configuration we can push it down to all the envoys that becomes much more responsive and you have much more control in terms of when envoy should actually see the new traffic now the so getting a little bit more deeper into this in order to uh, the way we do like service discovery is we do not actually do service discovery we literally like offload it down to kubernetes and the idea behind cisco is that service discovery is part of the platform and it's literally like in you know, a manifested in the form of dns so you go you talk to whatever service discovery it is you don't really care what ip addresses your service discovery returns it goes and talks to your kube dns kube dns returns a particular ip address which is a service plus cluster ip address we you i mean we just need the application to be able to do a dns resolution and then send the actual ip traffic once ip traffic comes on the wire we can actually capture that and then from then on we can look at the http headers for http traffic and if it's tcp traffic we can we look at the source destination in order to route the traffic accordingly so that's the role of service discovery and what we do is that like you know once we get uh, in terms of service registration so there are two parts to every service uh, managed system which is service registration and discovery once again service registration is also not part of it it is part of the underlying platform essentially like if it's kubernetes it will ensure that the pods are immediately registered as they come up and it's also responsible for maintaining the liveliness of pods and automatically managing the pods so, so can you use any we can use any other orchestrator as well so that's the idea behind the adapter model that we have at pilot so today we have a kubernetes adapter and we are also working on a console adapter so you and and a uric adapter so you can you can imagine that like you know, adapt add an adapter for those so or like standard vms in any way that you are what's the delegating power of the yes yes that's the assumption that the underlying platforms typically have this and or like bring your own uh what service oh no so the, the envoy and service does not really need to know what service is actually being offered because we will configure that envoy from here so this service registration is just necessary for like us to know what are the services in the system yes yes um can you today yes because i mean the way we kind of like we we assume that once you run pilot within a kubernetes cluster as a kubernetes service we actually like go talk to the api server within that cluster and kind of like cache the information but i think it's it's very trivial to actually point pilot to here is the kubernetes api server and here are the credentials go fetch the data that's a small detail. any other question okay so once like you know we have all the information we propagate it down to envoys and then the service here we expected to like you know use standard http syntax like http colon service b.example.com gets resolved you get the ip and when the call comes here then we look at the host headers and then we decide how to route traffic and basically since this envoy has the list of all pods that are actually serving service b we do load back at the client side it goes directly from envoy other pod there's no i mean we do not use a coop proxy or I mean, not the coop the ip tables setup that is actually there in kubernetes to do any sort of load balancing because the crux of the system is taking control of load balancing and that's where everything in istio starts falling into place 
basically like you know starts with load balancing but then you can actually apply richer traffic rules policies and so on and then the other part that we actually have is envoy also has concept concept of active health checks where where each envoy will actively poll other envoys in the system for you know the health information and like whether it's live or not based on that it'll actually make load balancing decisions the there is all obviously some sort of a contention here because Kubernetes also provides some health checks and it'll automatically deregister unhealthy pods in the system. And then there's also Envoy which does its own health checks. So the question is like, you know, who should I believe or like these are both required? And the answer is yes, both are, I mean, it's not a definitive yes, but it does not hurt to have both in place because Kubernetes is basically a platform level thing. It, it detects an unhealthy pod, it's actually gonna, uh, unregister the deregister the pod from Kubernetes API server, and then pilot is going to detect the change, and then it's going to generate the new configurations, and then it's going to push it down to all the other envoys. On the other hand, when all of these envoys are actually doing active health checks, they kind of have like first-hand information about who, which of my dependencies are actually healthy or unhealthy. So this, I mean, the convergence is much faster when you actually enable health checks on the envoy side. Eventually, you would push down the updated configuration, but until that unhealthy pod goes away, the, the envoys that are making the call would actually know who's healthy and who's unhealthy. So that's the idea behind having health checks from envoy as well as health checks on the platform level. Yeah. There will definitely be a delay, but that delay is bound by how quickly does Kubernetes recognize the fact that a particular pod is down. So that once that information goes back to the Kubernetes API server, then, and pilot basically gets a notification. Because all we do is we have a watch notification set up on the Kubernetes API server. We get notifications anytime there's a change in the service membership. So we would know what pods are down, what pods are coming up, so on. So that's, there's an eventual consistency delay in terms of when uh, information propagates. Which is why we have we encourage the health check on Envoy as well. So essentially, if you have like 100 pods here of which 10 of them go, become unhealthy and they get unregistered, it might take like a few milliseconds at tops or to in order for those, that information to propagate back to the caller Envoy. At the same time, if this Envoy here is actually doing periodic health checks, every millisecond, every 10 milliseconds, just as an example, then it is gonna have first-hand information about the fact that like out of these 100 pods, only these nine get actually alive. And so when it has to make an API call, it would automatically do the load balancing such that it would send it to the remaining 90 pods and not to the 10 unhealthy pods. And in the meantime, that information will propagate to Kubernetes and then which will come back to pilot and pilot will actually push the updated config. Yes, sir. Um, it is well. No, it's it's localized where each envoy is polling, and like so right now, it's an all-to-all -all thing where each envoy is polling other envoys, uh, other dependent. So whatever then the load balancer configuration, they'll poll all of them, and in order to keep track. And we're actually working on a, a different version of the health check API where we have delegation. So we'll actually delegate some envoys to be responsible for a bunch of envoys, so that not avoid the one cross. Process of traffic. Okay. So there are a few key concepts that come uh, with Pilot, the traffic management aspects of Pilot. And one of the first one, the, the one of the most important ones is label based routing. So this is something that is not present in Kubernetes or Mesos or most of the other platforms. The idea here is that like you know, you can decide, like, okay, so given a, this is an example of a route rule that you actually set up where you say from this destination server or traffic going to this destination service and originating from this particular service called service A, route tra 99 percent of these requests to pods that have these two labels and route one percentage of requests to pods that have these two labels. So you can actually achieve a version of this using let's say deployments in Kubernetes where you can actually do a rolling deployment and you can start like rolling out a new version of a service. Problem there is it's an in-place upgrade. So it's not an active, active configuration you actually literally go and 
sorry, it's not an active passive configuration. You actually go and literally replace a pod in place with newer labels such that when coop when the IP table stuff here on the caller side is actually trying to send requests, it would automatically get statistically load balanced across rough pods. The problem there is that if you want to get a 99 one split, you need to have a hundred pods. Whereas in this case, since we control load balancing, this is what I meant by like, load balancing across the entire system, we get to pick like what percentage of traffic should be sent to pod one versus pod. You can, even, you can just have two pods and decide to split traffic 99, 9010 or like 50, 50, whatever way you want. So you get fine grain control over traffic. And now the thing to he remember here is that in, in this case, service B has like, it's just one single Kubernetes service. It has like, you know, a bunch of pods. Some of them have the 1.5 and use fraud label, and some of them have the V 2.0 alpha label. So what we do internally at Pilot is we group pods based on the label clusters, and we create like, you know, bunch of pods like okay these are pods that share the the first two labels and so we create one set of uh, cluster based on that a cluster in an envoy sense it's not the kubernetes sense and then we create another set of pod based on uh, sorry another cluster based on the other label set and then we program we set up the configurations in envoy such that whenever traffic has to go to the appropriate uh, this label set we will route i'll actually show you a good a full example of this in the cup, uh, next slide but is the the high level concept clear? Yes, please. Oh, it's across. Oh, you mean like from? It's actually on the per pod basis. So from from every caller envoy will actually have a ninety nine one split. So. Yes, but over a span of like a few hundred requests, it will actually get the same thing. So, to give you a little bit more detail on this, actually, I can't see the next slide. Uh, there's one more thing that we actually do, which is the ability to look at the HTTP headers as well. So, because since Envoy is a full proxy at HTTP level, we can actually look at the content of the request and try to route traffic based to the appropriate pods. Now, the way we do this is, is as follows. I mean, the key to understanding Pilot is actually to, to understand the Envoy configuration because this is where like everything starts. So, if you, how many of you are familiar with Nginx configuration or the Google guys or HA proxy or okay? So, most people actually have some idea of Nginx configuration. So, if you look at an Envoy's configuration, a, a listener is basically equivalent to a server in Nginx. So, you define a listener which is on a particular port. And for that listener, you define here are the SSL certificates and so on and so forth. And within each listener, you actually have one or more what you call uh, server blocks. If for, in Nginx, for example, you have a HTTP block, you have a TCP block. In exactly the similar fashion, you actually have a HTTP proxy configuration, you have a TCP proxy con configuration, and you probably have like Redis configuration, Mongo configuration, and so on. And then the upstream in Nginx. Where you define like here are the different upstream clusters that's equivalent to a cluster in Envoy, and that is so that gives you a high level overview. Now, within within each cluster, you actually have a bunch of other configurations. You define the load balancing policies. You define the uh, SSL the SSL certificates to talk to the upstream clusters, and you can define other things like circuit breakers and so on. And then, as as an nginx, in each upstream, there's a whole bunch of IP addresses which correspond to the pods in that upstream. And so, these like so that that's part of the cluster itself. Now, the dynamic reload part of Envoy is, I mean, the configuration load part of Envoy is that the listener's configuration can actually be loaded by a listener yeah. discovery service. I know it's poorly named, but it's called listener discovery service. That that listener's configuration can be dynamically loaded. The whole of Envoy's configuration is a bit of JSON. It's like a one giant JSON, and each of these blocks can actually be dynamically loaded by different services. And then the clusters together can actually be loaded with a cluster discovery service. And now within each cluster, you have a list of upstream IPs corresponding to individual clusters. That in turn can be loaded by a service discovery. The idea to actually have a cluster discovery service and a service discovery service here is that 
the information of, on the list of all upstream nodes for a cluster can change much more frequently and dynamically. Whereas the number of upstream clusters, they don't change that frequently. And similarly, the uh, the listeners itself, you don't add and remove a hundred different like you know servers every second. Whereas you might do the same thing for like number of upstream IP addresses. And now, with the, uh, the listeners, the HTTP proxy configuration is something that's much more dynamic compared to a standard listener itself. So that HTTP proxy configuration can actually be loaded by something called a route discovery, which will dynamically load like you know conditions on which you can match the requests like you know match based on these http headers and then route to this or the traffic split for example like traffic that comes to this particular route like slash foo should be split 90 10 across cluster a and cluster b this is some configuration this is configuration they can actually load dynamically with rdl is there any question on this yes sir Yes. Yes. And the current question. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. I mean, yeah. So the all like the the proxy uh, the configuration for like traffic exiting. Yes. Oh, the upstream IP is the target IP. So whatever the backend IP addresses that you actually have. Yes, outbound. So now this is the, the configuration for Envoy. Now if you look at Kubernetes, now that throws a few like complications as well, which is you can have 10 different services listening on the same port. <coughs> Kubernetes allows you to differentiate based on the, do the domain name of the service and or the services cluster, I cluster level IP address. Now, for HTTP, we can definitely differentiate different upstream services by looking at the host header. HTTP host headers suppose is mandatory, and that actually indicates the service that you actually want to reach. For TCP, if you look at the uh, the cluster IP address with which a service is being reached, you can differentiate what is the destination that it's going to. So you could have three different services on port 5506, and depending on the target IP address to which uh, uh, particular connection is going to, you can decide the route to the appropriate upstream cluster. Now, but then what happens within a pod? How do we capture traffic from within a pod and then start routing? Because the, uh, so if you look at it in a different way, what we do is we actually, we can, if we don't have an IP tables based like traffic capture and thing, we could just run an Envoy and we could make Envoy listen on all, but all possible ports or other services. But then what happens if the app on that service is listening on port 5506 and is also accessing other services on port 5506. Then it starts contending. So then you start actually having like a messy conflict. I mean, it's not even possible to do that. So this is where we actually added something called as like a virtual listener and a real listener. So what we do is is that like you know we have one envoy, I mean the physical listener, actually listening on a particular TCP port, like which is basically port 5000. So in every port, if you go and check today, you will actually find that there's only one Envoy on port 5000. There's no, Envoy is not listening on any other port. But what we do is that when we do re traffic redirection with IP tables, the kernel will actually preserve the actual destination to which that connection went. So it, it's port 5506 with, uh, with address 1.1.1. .1 .1. That'll actually be preserved. You can actually obtain that information through a special system call with uh, an IOCTL or is it a, it, this is a system called by which you can actually obtain what was the original destination to which this connection actually went to. So we use that, we obtain that information, and then we basically multiplex and see, okay, we pass, it, pass that connection on to one of the virtual listeners, and from there on, traffic goes out to get processed in the usual way. So this is actually how we like capture traffic all in one, in bulk, and then this is the key behind the whole transparent proxying stuff that happens in Istio. Capture traffic as it is, and then, like, you know, from there, we just decide to split it to the appropriate list. Uh, destination IP, you mean? Oh, no, you, you, that source IP is there, yes, that's still there.
Yes. Ah, no, no, no. So the client sends it. I mean, the client does not even know Anwa is there. It just simply sends it to service b.example.com colon 5506. The traffic gets trapped by IP tables and it gets redirected to port 5000. When it comes to port 5000, Anwa basically like, you know, extracts the actual IP address like, oh, it went to 1.1.1 port 5506. When it looks at port 5506, it passes it on to the listener for 5506. And once it gets into the listener, based on the actual source, destination, IP address and so on, it gets directed to the appropriate up upstream cluster. So it, all this is happening at the egress point from uh, the application when the traffic takes the application, goes out of the application to other port. When an Envoy receives connection, it will actually receive connection. Once again, since all traffic coming into the port is also trapped, it will again enter port 5000. But at that point, it's it's a very, it's a direct pass through to the application in the back end. We don't have to do much of like multiplex. But yes, a port, Simplicity purposes, the same thing happens on the egress and ingress form. Yes. Yes. Yes, hundreds are going to different clusters. So it's not uh, on listener basis, it's on a cluster level basis. And I'll actually show you in the next slide as to like how that split is happening. But so once the connection is received, Anwa basically has like a whole bunch of like, you know, it, it's a random number of stuff and decides like, okay, it's going to go to cluster two or bar and has spread traffic across one of the clusters. Yes. 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 No, it is not. Because when traffic leaves Envoy, it, it is standard IP traffic. It's the original port and original this thing. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's still transparent. So the way we do that is like once we receive the traffic and like we hand it off the appropriate listener and they do the SSL termination based on like looking at the uh, SAN field where the service's name is tied to the service account in Kubernetes. That's how we actually do the SSL termination. Yes. Yes, we cannot see if you if you send HTTPS traffic directly from your pod, we treat it as TCP traffic and we just like pass it through. So which is why if you're using Istio auth, the Rate limit in as such in uh, in SEO is that it's done on the ingress level, so all mixer track, uh, all mixer functionalities get activated at the ingress level. So essentially, like when it, whenever traffic enters an envoy, like from as an ingress traffic, it goes to the mixer, and the mixer can decide to do global rate limiting based on like you know uh, like signals from all the other envoys that this is how much traffic this particular service is receiving, and then decide to like you know drop the traffic or accept the traffic. But that said, there's also another form of rate limit. I wouldn't say rate limiting, but throttling, which is the circuit breaker configuration, which decides there's going to be maximum of 1024 concurrent connections going to this specific cluster and a maximum of 1024 uh, requests per connection and so on. That is handled by Envoy local. So when it when that Envoy, the client side Envoy is making a request, it is not going to allow more than 1024 connections to any uh, uh, through the upstream cluster. Which, in, which is actually an aggregate of all the connections across all pods. Oh, the global rate limiting is, uh, well, that, I mean, so it depends on how much of the global rate limit. I think Lyft guys already do that. So yes, there is a scalability issue, and which is why things like rate limiting are like, you know, it's more like if you do it if you have you the APA management edge. Kind of a thing where you are metering things and you're charging people by like you know first million api calls is you know free for the next one million api calls is three bucks and so on right so at that point you really want to like you know since you're charging money you would actually do it 
but within the cluster yes there is definitely a scalability problem and there are ways to mitigate that by caching but there's still if you want strong consistency there's going to be a scalability issue you're okay with eventual consistency and like you know exceeding and the rate limits by a small amount then you can cache have stale information and doing any other question i don't think that's it oh that's it yes 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 that's not part of this one yes so that's that that's completely different and that's like it's left to the api management layer which is which is built on top of the mixer or it's a some separate uh, component itself like bring your own api management tool and that thing that for passes traffic into the internal cluster so if you want to build your own api management stuff then you build your own set of like tools on top of the mixer where which is where you would actually impose these global rate limits and the mixer is actually then you would actually have something like a mixer that ha uh, sits at the uh, so this is your ingress controller and this you can imagine that this all your api management stuff the, this will call the mixer and the mix the api management stuff sits at top of the mixer what what i'm saying so it's like so for example this right so all traffic enters here and you do your api management top of the mixer and that rate limit is only applied at the ingress envoy not at all the envoys in the system. Yes. Yes. Yeah, all of the headers are just passed through. It's like whatever comes in, just yeah, there's nothing gets. It's the only thing that gets stripped is probably the uh, exported for headers, the connection upgrade upgrade headers, because it's like you know, if it's a WebSocket thing, it passes passes the upgrade headers. But if it's not WebSocket, it strips the upgrade headers. But other there's like a few standard. Proxy specific stuff that every proxy would actually strip. Other than that, everything is a pass. There's you don't have to configure. Uh, logically, yes. Logically, you could actually imagine that like everything that ends up going to the mixer, but then there's a there's a whole bunch of caching involved, such that like you know the uh, the checks. Are basically based on a very standard set of attributes. For every request, Envoy extracts like 10, 15 attributes, passes them to the mixer. The mixer decides yes or no. Okay. Yes. Any other question? If not, I can. Okay. Thank you, folks.